Barry Strauss has finally done what, what of course, every uh, historian, every classicist uh, lives to do. He's written a management book. Um, <laughs> Uh, Masters of Command uh, about Alexander, Hannibal, and Caesar. You saw the, the, the trailer. It is, it is of course, uh, a, a management book for uh, would-be empire builders, uh, you know, which you know, we all are at some, at some level. Our empires are of different sizes, particularly as, as we, uh, we, get, we get older. And, and he talks about the 10 key ingredients in leadership for, for those of us who are empire builders, you know, ambition, uh, audacity, uh, leadership, agility, um, uh, strategy, uh, uh, et cetera. And, but, the, but, but some of the, the key ingredients are, are perhaps, well, one of them is, is certainly found in, in, in most management books, judgment. And I, I'd like to say that the Kansas City Public Library is showing great judgment in bringing Barry Strauss back for the fourth time to the Kansas City Public Library. But there are a couple of ingredients here that are not in the typical management book. But I would say here at the Kansas City Public Library, we like to say um, that we have learned from uh, Barry's book. Uh, there is terror, uh, for instance. <laughs> And, 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 and actually, here at the Kansas City Public Library, we know about terror. I appear periodically before the uh, city council uh, to <laughs> protest, protest their tax abatement policies, which affect the library. Um, and, and of course, we know about terror here at the public library because uh, we know that Henry Fortunato does not have a driver's license. Um, <laughs> and, and so we know, we know about terror. But, the, but then, the, you know, the final, the final ingredient in, uh, in Barry's uh, management book, uh, Masters of Command, about Alexander, Caesar, and Hannibal, um, is really unique uh, for management books in our time. It's divine providence. We also know about divine providence here at the, at the library because nobody dies at these city council meetings. That has to be, has to be divine providence. And no one dies when Henry is on the streets. Um, and, and so we know, uh, we know uh, indeed uh, that divine providence is at work. Um, but divine providence is also at work in the fact that we are able to get, I mean, he is now the champion uh, lecturer at the Kansas City Public Library for this being the fourth time. It must be divine providence uh, that we've got uh, Barry Strauss back again. Uh, Barry has written wonderful books about the Trojan War, about the Battle of Salamis, uh, and about uh, Spartacus. Um, he's, he's a well-known uh, TV performer these days, and if, if anyone's doing anything on, uh, uh, on, on, the, uh, uh, on ancient history, uh, Barry has got to participate uh, in it. Um, uh, he, he, is, uh, he is also um, a great teacher. Um, and indeed, I, I had, I, as I was researching my, my introduction, and you know, I go into deep research for these introductions, as you, as you might know, um, I went to there. I, I could I could actually go to ratemyprofessors.com, uh, <laughs> and the Cornell University part of this, and they, and his students rate uh, rate Barry, and and of course he gets a very high rating, a 4.6. I think that's on a five point scale. Is that right, Barry? It's a five point scale, not a ten point. Well, I, <laughs> let's assume let's assume it's a five point scale, um, and it's a, it's actually quite high rating. That's the overall quality, and he gets you know helpfulness 4.5, clarity 4.7, and you'll get that tonight, I'm sure. Easiness is a 3.1. <laughs> now I think that's because the students want it to be really easy, and, and, and he challenges us. And in fact, let me read the comment, to the, the comment from one student uh, that, that's in this, that's blogged after this. Um, requires extremely good skill in note taking. Strauss does entire, entire lectures orally. The slides are only pictures to support his orally delivered material, as interesting as they may be. It is difficult to remember everything he said when the exam comes. <laughs> there is no place to find past lecture material if you miss a class. So his last advice to students is, don't skip class, ever. <laughs> I like that, don't skip, and, 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 and so we, we've, we've invited Barry uh, uh, here tonight, and I can tell uh, that all of you uh, have gotten the message uh, about Barry Strauss. We, we're not skipping class tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Barry Strauss. Thank you. Wait till after my talk. <laughs> See if you want to applaud. Well, I don't know what to say after such a generous introduction, uh, except to say that um, uh, it's just uh, remarkable uh, to see uh, 
what uh, Crosby and Henry and Chapta and all of you have built here up in, in Kansas City. Uh, the secret is out as to what a superb venue this is for historians and for public affairs uh, and what a great uh, and literate uh, public um, there, there is here in this town. And as a, as a New Yorker, that's something for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, uh, Crosby's given away all my secrets, so I'll do my best uh, to, uh, to, to try to keep you interested. Uh, as he told you, I want to talk tonight about my latest book, which Masters of Command, Alexander, Hannibal, Caesar, and the Genius of Leadership. And yeah, maybe it is a little bit of a stab at a management book, uh, but I prefer to think of it as a book uh, that uh, might tell us something about politics as well as about warfare. At any rate, political leadership is very much on our minds these days, 2012 being an election year. And um, it occurred to me, and even more to my publicist, that <laughs> there are more reasons than usual to study uh, these great figures of the past. So let me try to tell you about some of those reasons. Uh, I, I want to tell you a bit about these folks that I spent several years studying, Alexander, Hannibal, and Caesar. Uh, a little bit about why I think they're worth studying, about what the lessons are. Uh, and what we might learn from them today. But I want to begin by making one thing clear. This is not going to be an exercise in hero worship. I am not <coughs> blindly looking at these three and just saying, wow. Uh, I don't really think that anybody could. Uh, for all of their achievements, these were pretty scary guys. And among other things, they were professional killers. And we can't forget that. Uh, if I think they're worth studying, um, it's because I think they are good to think with, that they raise questions that we can wrestle with. But it's certainly not because I think we ought to want to be governed by Alexander, Hannibal, or Caesar. Uh, far from it. Well, why these three? They all come from the ancient world. They're all classics. I like the ancient world, but I think you should like the ancient world as well, because there is something refreshingly honest about the ancient world. Uh, refreshingly elemental about the ancient world. We can look at things more bluntly than we can when talking about current events. Um, it's easier to assess the strengths and weaknesses. And yet antiquity remains a dress rehearsal for modern times. We see ourselves in the mirror of antiquity. Uh, the Western world is still influenced by uh, the ancients. Of course, we're not only the children of the ancients but part of us goes back to them. And so they are, they're perenni perennially eloquent and instructive. Alexander, Hannibal, and Caesar are certainly the three greatest captains, as they've long been called, of antiquity. They're the big three of ancient warfare. They're not the only great warriors from antiquity. Pyrrhus, Pericles, Philip of Macedon, Cyrus, there are others that we could look at. And yet these three are uniquely tied. For one thing, they thought of themselves as a trio. Alexander came first. He set the mold. Born in 356, died in 323 BC, a great conqueror. And then, a little more than a century later, came Hannibal, who modeled himself on Alexander, down to having professional historians come with him and chronicle everything he did. And then came Caesar. And when Caesar was a man in his 30s, the story goes, he looked at a statue of Alexander and he wept because he thought, at my age, Alexander was dead. And what little have I accomplished? More scientifically, all three of them follow a similar pattern. In all three cases, uh, we have a brilliant general who had a professional but very small army. And in all three cases, he set out to conquer a much larger empire with relatively few resources. Alexander set out to conquer the Persian Empire, the largest empire, not only of his day, but the largest empire that the world had ever seen in his lifetime. Hannibal set out to conquer the Roman Empire. Uh, and the Romans, although not at their height of power yet, uh, well, that was no small nut to crack. 
And Caesar, of course, also set out to conquer the Roman Empire. He was a Roman, of course, but he was a provincial governor. It would be as if the governor of one state, God forbid, would try to conquer the entire <laughs> United States. Um, and Caesar succeeded. A few other scientific things about the three of them. They, um, they all were basically land warriors. They didn't do ships. They didn't have great navies, and yet they all took on powers that did have great navies, and they had to uh, deal with that. Uh, none of them had very much money. They all had money problems, and they all had to raise money as part of what they were doing, and they faced enemies who had enormous amounts of money. Furthermore, their enemies were established empires. They were legitimate. They had strong support, and Alexander, Hannibal, and Caesar had to face all these, uh, all these difficulties. Alexander and Caesar, of course, succeeded. And Hannibal almost succeeded, but ultimately failed. One other thing, and this is something I'm going to come back to again and again in the presentation, tonight's talk. All of them were more than mere generals. They were all three soldier statesmen. They were politicians as well as generals. And they were orators. And all three of them were men of vision. They loved war, they loved the feel of battle, the experience of battle, but they all wanted more than battle. They were fighting for a cause, for a purpose. And one way that we must judge them is whether they achieve this purpose or not. So I want to do, talk about three things, really. Um, first, I just want to give you a very brief overview of their three careers. Second, I want to talk about uh, that issue that Crosby raised, uh, the 10 qualities that you need if you want to conquer the world, and perhaps just even conquer a much smaller world. And third, I want to talk about another of uh, the terrible lists I'm afraid I come up with in this book, and that's the five stages of war. I think that would be useful as well. And I want to say a little bit as I go about the election. I promise you I will be nonpartisan, and uh, I will make enemies of everyone. So let's begin with a few slides. And we'll begin with Alexander. He comes first. Appropriately, you can see a lot about Alexander in this coin. Uh, he is beardless for the Greeks. That meant he was young, and indeed he was young. He died just short of his 33rd birthday, and he was 22 when he invaded the Persian Empire. Basically the age of a college senior, and in many ways, he behaved like a college senior. <laughs> One of my favorite facts about, about Alexander is that he pulled all-nighters. Seriously. The sources say, you know, and the guy, you'd be up all night, and you couldn't get him up until noon the next day. Uh, I have a 19-year-old at home that makes complete sense to me. <laughs> this is a coin. It's a propaganda. It's a statement. Alexander is meant to be good-looking. His hair is meant to be windswept as if he's moving forward. And you'll notice those little horns. Uh, that is an allusion to the fact that Alexander went in Egypt to the shrine of Zeus Ammon, where the Egyptian Zeus is associated with a ram. And there, Alexander claimed that he was greeted as the son of Zeus. He'd already been greeted as the son of a god. Um, one way to look at this is this is ancient Greek for celebrity. And he, he ran with it. He depicted himself as the son of a god because only the son of a god, he felt, uh, could achieve what he did. You notice also the ribbon that is a sign of royalty. Now, Alexander's success, as I said, was in conquering the Persian Empire. He set off from Macedon, the northern part of what is nowadays Greece, with a small army. He had only about 35,000 men with about another 15 to 20,000 already having crossed over uh, into what is today Turkey. Uh, and he proceeded to do what he claimed he would. He conquered the entire Persian Empire. Really a remarkable feat. As much as we can point out the weaknesses of Persia, nonetheless, uh, it was an outstanding military achievement. Political achievement, well, not quite as good. Military achievement 
I just can't resist showing you the scene of one of Alexander's greatest battles. This is the site of the Battle of Issus. It took place in what is nowadays southwestern Turkey. It's right near the Syrian border. This is an area that's been in the news a lot because they're Syrian refugees. The main city there is called Iskenderun, uh, na originally named Alexandria, named for Alexander and this battle uh, that was fought on the banks of this river, the ancient Pinaris, the modern Pius. Those are the Amanas Mountains in the distance. Nowadays, uh, there are a lot of uh, Kurdish guerrillas in that mountain, in those mountains who come down and attack Turkish military uh, installments in the plain, the Mediterranean is not far away, and you see the, the edge of a steel plant, I'm afraid. Uh, not a very salubrious place, but kind of a remarkable site. Almost no one visits it. Visits it. So pol great military success in conquering the Persian Empire, but politically, Alexander did not succeed. Within a year of his death, the, his empire was falling apart. And in fact, it took the next 50 years for Alexander's generals and his, uh, his wannabes to fight a series of very bloody wars over who would control this new empire. And the answer in the end was no one would. The empire was split up into a series of constituent states, by and large Greek states, or states run by people who spoke Greek, Greek and Macedonian states. So it wasn't a Persian empire anymore. And Alexander had succeeded in changing the world that way. But there was new, no new single empire. There was no dynasty. Alexander had two sons, and they were both murdered very young. So in his political goal of creating a new Al Persian empire, Alexander failed. How about Hannibal? Well, we don't have a good ancient image of Hannibal, but we do have this rather spectacular coin. Uh, this is a bit of pro political propaganda as well, uh, made either by Hannibal or perhaps his father or his brother-in-law, who preceded him as the heads of the Carthaginian mission in Spain. Spain was the Carthaginian imperial base in that period. Carthage, of course, is in North Africa. We'll see in a moment. It's not Hannibal. Anyone know who it is? No, nope, good guess, but no, nope, not his father. Melkart? Yes, Melkart. And who's Melkart? Heracles, yeah, and how can you tell? Yeah, the royal wreath is helpful. It's a club. Hercules carries a club. That's his symbol. Um, and uh, there's a great Nathaniel Hawthorne Tanglewood tale about Hercules and his club. Uh, and you can see uh, that this guy, I mean, he's, he does a lot of weightlifting. You can see from his... <laughs> from his neck. Uh, he's a big guy. He's got a beard, unlike uh, Alexander. Why uh, Heracles, Hercules, Melkart? Well, Melkart is the Carthaginian version. Uh, Greek and Roman myth said that Hercules went to the west. He was the first person to open up the western Mediterranean for the Greeks and for the Phoenicians. And that's why the Strait of Gibraltar is called the Pillars of Hercules. When the Carthaginians conquered southern Spain. They conquered what is nowadays Andalusia, if you know Spain or if you think of Islamic Spain. Uh, at the city of modern Cadiz, ancient Gades, they set up a temple to Heracles. And it was Heracles at the end of the world, because this was the Atlantic Ocean. This was a sign that Heracles, or Melkart, the Carthaginian version, approved of what they had done. And Hannibal and his father, Hamilcar, before him, they advertised themselves to the Roman world, to the Greek world, as the descendants, the followers of Hercules and Heracles. Now, this really hurt the Romans, because the Romans believed that they were the true followers of Hercules. They had shrines to Hercules in Rome. And when Hannibal invaded Italy and the Romans started losing, they felt there was a Hercules gap. <laughs> and they had to get the favor of Hercules back. So they moved the Temple of Hercules from the edge of the city to the Capitoline Hill to the most sacred place in town. It took a while for it to help. Uh, but, and Hannibal also knew that the Greek cities of Italy that had been conquered by the Romans, they were all devotees of Heracles, the Greek version, and that Heracles was the rallying cry, an anti-Roman rallying cry, fight for Heracles. And so the Barca family are advertising themselves as the new Hercules. Just to make sure everyone gets the message, 
If you turn the coin over, uh, you see uh, the equivalent of a tank or a drone. <laughs> uh, they also say, and we have the scariest weapons you're ever going to see. We have these elephants. When Hannibal, the, the one thing we all know about Hannibal is he crossed the Alps with his elephant, 37 uh, to be precise, and he would have liked it that way. All of these men put a huge amount of em emphasis on public relations. It's bad to have someone on a book tour giving this talk because that loom, it will loom very large. But they wanted people to remember them with easy and clear symbols. And for Hannibal, it was the elephants. Most of his army didn't make it over the Alps, but as far as we know, all of his elephants did. We hear nothing about any elephants being lost. And even though they died shortly thereafter in northern Italy, he made his point. Uh, and it was a very powerful uh, symbol. So Hannibal, here on this map, you can see Carthage, which is in a suburb of the modern city of Tunis. And you can see the Carthaginian Empire in Spain, centered in the south. The city of New Carthage, nowadays Cartagena in Spain. Uh, Cadiz, I am no expert in Spain, but it's over here. Cartagena here. And when Hannibal made war on the Romans, he inherited this war from his father, just as Alexander inherited his war from his father. Hannibal felt correctly that the Romans were muscling in on Carthage's empire in Spain. The Romans, in an earlier war, had robbed Carthage, deprived Carthage of its empire in Sicily and Sardinia. The Carthaginians had bounced back and created a new empire in Spain, bigger and better than the first one. And now Hannibal saw the Romans threatening that, so he declared war on Rome. The Romans, he knew, planned to invade North Africa and Spain to put the squeeze on Hannibal. But Hannibal was not going to sit still. Hannibal had a daring plan to invade Italy. Only one problem. He didn't have a fleet. And so what he did was he marched his army 900 miles over land, over the Rhone and over the Alps. Not real wise to cross the Alps in the late autumn beginning of the winter, which is what he did, uh, and fetched up in northern Italy, uh, evading a Roman army sent to stop him along the way. The Romans were terrified, and with good cause, because Hannibal knew that he was the absolute best tactician of his day, and in fact, possibly the best tactician of ancient military history altogether. One of the best tacticians and, and um, men in operations of all history. You, uh, those of you uh, of my age will remember that Patton was a great uh, devotee of Hannibal, and with good reason. And Hannibal went on to defeat, to hand the Romans some of their biggest losses in their entire history. In fact, one of their two biggest losses in the all of Roman military history, the Battle of Cannae, uh, in which in one day in August 216 BC, he killed 50,000 Roman soldiers. But well, and here is uh, more or less the battlefield of Cannae. We don't know exactly in what part of the field the battle is fought. I have my ideas, and some of my colleagues have theirs. But this is roughly what we're looking at, this plain. Perfect for Hannibal's army, which was a true, true combined arms force and mixture of cavalry and infantry. In spite of this, in spite of this stunning victory, a victory that's still studied in staff colleges around the world today, he lost. He lost the war. The Romans won. One of the things we need to explain this evening is why that happened. And finally, Caesar. This coin, Julius Caesar, it's Caesar Imperator. Caesar the victorious general, the word which later on goes to mean emperor, though not in Caesar's lifetime. A very different kind of figure. Um, he's not buff like Hercules, and he's not young and charismatic. In fact, he's wearing a wreath that is strategically designed to hide his baldness, <laughs> about which he was very vain. Um, we should all wear wreaths. Um, and the Romans in this period liked their leaders to look kind of plain. They liked them to look weather-beaten, broken in. That was the Roman way. And Caesar certainly looks this in this coin. Caesar's war is a rather complicated. At the beginning of it, he was the governor of Gaul, which included most of France and Belgium, uh, uh, the Riviera, Romans knew how to pick them, <laughs> and northern Italy. 
And um, he wanted to come back to Rome. He wanted the highest political office. And it was generally thought he wanted to dominate the state. Because Caesar, before he became a victorious general, was one of the leading politicians in Rome. In fact, one of the most brilliant and aggressive politicians the Romans had ever seen. His enemies in Rome decided they would rather fight than allow him to do it. Rather, they, they actually demanded that Caesar resign his office and come home and stand trial. And Caesar wasn't going to fall for it. Instead, he invaded Rome. He crossed the Rubicon, the little stream that's the boundary between, that was the boundary between his province of Gaul and Roman Italy, and began a civil war in 49 BC, and proceeded to conquer Italy almost bloodlessly in six weeks, and then, uh, in a masterful fashion, defeated his greatest enemy, Pompey, in a battle here in Greece at Pharsalus a year later, after almost being defeated by Pompey at Dyrrhachium, in the city of Durez in modern Albania. Before then, he had, had a detour and conquered Spain. Afterwards, he conquers Egypt. Oh, sorry, Egypt here, the kingdom of the Ptolemies and uh, meets a, a young queen, or would-be queen, named Cleopatra. Uh, and the two of them uh, have a very good to come together and have a son named Little Caesar. <laughs> Quite literally, his name was Little Caesar, Caesarian. <laughs> Caesar then spends a great deal of time raising money, because you need money, and Caesar knew it. When a quick little victory here in northern Turkey, which I'll come back to later, and then invaded North Africa and back to Spain. Before he won his war, came home to Rome, now was the master of the Roman world, tested the political waters, and what can I say? It was like going to a meeting of the faculty senate <laughs> after winning the Nobel Prize. When your colleagues say, who do you think you are? And Caesar said, you know, this was fun, but I just remembered I have to make war on Iran. And I'm going to be gone for the next three years. It's going to take a long time. Uh, while I'm gone, you, you boys behave. Uh, I guess I've got to go to one last Senate meeting before I leave. And that was the Ides of March, three days before he was scheduled to leave. You know the rest. Um, Caesar did manage to leave a dynasty behind, but he did not get to enjoy his victory for very long. So, oh yeah, Caesar's battle. I don't ha didn't have a nifty slide of Pharsalus ready, uh, but this is Corfinium. This is the city in the Abruzzo that Caesar lays siege to and so frightens the people there that they surrendered uh, without a proper siege taking place. It's a very beautiful little corner of Italy, much forgotten. I do recommend it. Nearby, just to the south of it, there's a town called Sulmona, a little better known to tourists, but not very. Um, so if you're looking for new places to go in Italy, that would be a nice one. Um, unknown battle site. OK, if um, we can have the lights on, please. Oh, they are on. But the screen up. More lights on. The slide off. You can leave the slide on. It's fine. Um, I want to talk now about how they did it and these 10 uh, keys to uh, success uh, that uh, Crosby referred to. Okay, so the first one is ambition. And you might think, well, what's such a big deal about that? Well, the Greeks called it love of honor, and they also called it big-headedness. But I think the uh, best uh, statement on ambition comes from Abraham Lincoln, uh, and before he became a vampire hunter. <laughs> Lincoln when he was a young man, he gave a speech at the Athenaeum, called the Athenaeum speech. And in it, he said that history includes leaders who have very special qualities. They belong to what he called the tribe of the eagle. And he said that these were people with such great ambition and such great talents that they wanted to achieve things beyond those that anyone else could. And they were so successful, they had so much success in them that they were a danger to everyone around them. And he leaves open the question of what he wanted to do and what he was willing to stop at at his achievements. Now think about it. Lincoln is very rightly considered one of the two greatest American presidents. He saved the Union. He freed the slaves. And he didn't blink at a war that 
cost 600,000 dead. 600,000 dead is a lot of dead in a country with a population of 31 million, which was the population of the United States in 1860. So when Caesar says there are people with extraordinary ambitions, excuse me, when Lincoln says that, uh, he knows what he is talking about. It's a reminder that our leaders can have access to qualities that are sometimes inspiring, but also rather frightening. The second quality that you need to uh, operate on this level is strategy. Strategy for the Greeks means the art of war. And I mean it in the broadest sense. You need to be a master of tactics to know how to win a battle, a master of operations to know how to move armies from place to place, and to have a complicated uh, series of moves on the military chessboard. You need to have a strategy for the war, an overall picture of how you plan to win. And if you are a soldier statesman, you also need to have a grand strategy. You need to be able to answer the question of what the war is for. What's the purpose of the war? What's the reason you're fighting, other than the fact that, for these folks, war was fun? <laughs> the third quality that you need, or I just have to say, in our terms, we might think of strategy as the vision thing. The third quality that you need is judgment. And judgment is the ability to make the right decision on the spot. They weren't college professors. They didn't have the luxury of going back to their study and thinking and rethinking and uh, getting rid of the document and writing a new document. They had to make decisions then and there. My favorite example is Alexander. Before the battle, I showed you the Battle of Issus. He is actually cut off by the Persian army, led by King Darius. They end up mistakenly in his rear, and they cut him off from his base. Alexander doesn't panic. At the, you know, at the drop of a drachma, he turns around, he addresses the men, he says, we're going to fight here, it's perfect. We couldn't have asked for a better place to fight. We don't need any supplies. It helps that Alexander is a cavalryman, and he's used to sleeping under the stars. Cavalry don't need their bases as much as others. He turns the army around, marches them to the banks of that river I showed you, and he wins. He has good judgment, and again and again, these leaders have good judgment. The fourth quality is leadership. Now, when I wrote a draft of this, I said to my editor, this isn't going to work, right? I'm giving you, it's a book about leadership, and I say that one of the things you need to be a leader is leadership. And he said, no, you have to have a category of leadership. What I'm referring to is the ability to get people to follow you, and the ability to do so on two levels on a higher level, a level of authority, and on a lower and more familiar level. And Caesar is a great example of this. Caesar was such a powerful speaker, and he uh, so impressed and frightened his men that when faced with a mutiny, he's able to put the mutiny down with one word. Normally, Caesar addressed his men as my fellow soldiers. In Latin, it's one word, uh, comilitonis, my fellow soldiers. And this time, he gets up in front of this mutinous uh, assembly of soldiers. And what they're mutinying about, of course, is they want to be paid, which he hasn't done. And he looks at them, and he says, citizens. And they begin to think, I, we've just been fired. <laughs> we don't want to be demoted to citizens. We want to be fellow soldiers. And that ends the mutiny. But there's another side of Caesar. There's the side of Caesar that appears in a letter written after his assassination by one of his lieutenants, a man named Gaius Matius. It's a letter to Cicero, and Gaius Matius says, I didn't follow him because he was Caesar. I followed him because he was my friend. It's that ability as well, which Caesar achieves by sharing the hardships of the men, by being with them on camp, by letting them know he's one of them. This ability to, uh, to lead on these two different levels, that's so crucial to what they are doing. The next quality is audacity. Uh, and there's something simply audacious about what they do. Crossing the Rubicon, declaring war on all of Rome when you're a provincial governor and you actually only have one legion with you at the moment, 5,000 men. Or crossing the Dardanelles, the Hellespont, if you will, with a small army to take on the entire Persian Empire 
when you don't have a reliable navy. Or marching 900 miles to cross the Alps with 37 elephants against the Romans, who outclass you in so many ways. Audacity is a weapon in and of itself. And the political uses of audacity are obvious. We've seen it in our own lifetimes and in the last electoral cycle. Audacity can be uh, used skillfully. It can be a very potent tool. Agility is another thing that they had. They were able to roll with the punches, or I should say, to a degree, they were able to roll with the punches. Uh, Alexander was a master of conventional warfare, the set battle. But he also turned out to be a master of unconventional warfare. When he gets to Afghanistan, it's commonly said that even Alexander lost in Afghanistan. Not true. He won in Afghanistan. He, and Afghanistan remained a, uh, uh, a province run by Greek-speaking kings for centuries. However, it is true that Alexander took very heavy casualties in, Af in Afghanistan. And he was forced to face conditions that he hadn't fought before. And then afterwards, it might be one of the reasons why his army ultimately mutinied, because the conditions they faced in Afghanistan and then later in Pakistan uh, were so devastating to them. But he did win. Caesar, also a master of conventional battle, but able to succeed at urban street fighting. And Hannibal, Hannibal is a great trickster, a trickster on the battlefield, but also off it. Very few people uh, were so skilled as Hannibal and so successful uh, in small operations against the enemy so, and to trick them. Infrastructure. Well, all of these generals had great armies. They inherited great armies. Alexander and Hannibal inherited great armies from their fathers, Philip of Macedon and Hamilcar Barca. Caesar inherited a great army as the Roman army. And yet, each of these men took those armies and made them something better. Alexander was the man who honed the Macedonian cavalry and made it the striking arm of the Macedonian military. Hannibal took a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multilingual, multinational force, and he turned it into an army that was so well uh, bound to get together that Hannibal alone of these three leaders is the only one who never faces a mutiny. His army is in Italy for 15 years, having good times and bad times, and they never mutiny, because Hannibal knows how to handle this very difficult army to control. Uh, and infrastructure, well, uh, Caesar, he takes his army and gets this army to suffer through great hardships. The siege of Dyrrhachium, when the army is almost starving, when another army would have fallen apart, Caesar's army holds together because of the example that Caesar says. Infrastructure also is money, and all three of these men spend a lot of time uh, raising money. I'll give you just one example. Two years ago, I was lucky enough to be able to follow Alexander's footsteps in Turkey. I went with a friend of mine, uh, a Turkish historian and guide who I've worked with before, and we had his car, and we spent two weeks tracing Alexander's steps. And when I went there, one of the questions I had is, what did Alexander do in Turkey for 18 months? He gets there, he wins this one battle in the beginning in northwestern Turkey, and then at the end, he wins this other battle in southern Turkey, and then he leaves, he goes into Syria. What happens in the 18 months in between? And I figured it out on this trip. He's shaking the people down for money. <laughs> he goes from city to city and says, I bring you good news, you've been liberated. You're now a democracy, and you'll be paying taxes to me, the son of Zeus. Really, that's what the guy was doing. He also was dealing with the threat of the Persian Navy, which was still a very live one. But raising money was the main thing. OK, after infrastructure comes terror. Terror was a major tool that they used. Caesar used it most sparingly, not in the Gallic War. When Caesar conquered Gaul, he broke all records for terror. Um, Plutarch tells us that Caesar, in conquering Gaul, killed a million soldiers and a million civilians. Now, these are huge exaggerations. But let's say he only killed 100,000 soldiers and 100,000 civilians. That's still a lot of people. So much so that Caesar's enemies in Rome said that he should be delivered, tied, hand and foot, to his enemies to do with him what they wished, because he had 
besmirch the name of the Romans by carrying out such atrocities. But in the Civil War, Caesar says, it's the new improved Caesar. We don't do massacres anymore. The new policy is forgiveness, pardon. Now think about this. There is a wonderful Latin word for this. Here is the governor of Gaul saying to Roman senators, representatives of the nation, I pardon you. <laughs> the Latin word, of course, is chutzpah. <laughs> Hannibal, when he crosses the Alps, before he invaded Italy, he had sent secret agents to northern Italy. Northern Italy at the time uh, was not run by Romans, but rather by Celts. And they had been conquered by the Romans not much before this. They hated the Roman yoke. Hannibal sends his agents there, and they said, we're going to come and liberate you. You want to join us against the Romans? And they say, yeah, we'd love to do that. Hannibal, they say, how many troops do you have? He says, ah, big army, 100,000 men, lots of horses and elephants. And then we get to December 1st, 218 BC, and Hannibal and the remnant of his army come out of the Alps. There are about 25,000 men, not many horses, 37 elephants, and they look awful. They've nearly been destroyed in this march from Spain. And they come to the Celts and say, hey, we're here. You promised to help us. And the Celts say, are you crazy? The Romans are going to kill you. We don't want any part of it. So Hannibal says, oh, very interesting. He goes to the nearest Celtic city, which is the capital city of the Taurini, nowadays Turin, Torino, and he massacres everyone in it. And he says, um, can we re revisit the question of supporting me? And now the Celts join him very quickly. Uh, and finally, Alexander. Alexander, I'm afraid, is the worst of them all when it comes to terror. He becomes king at the age of 20 when his father, Philip of Macedon, is assassinated. The Greeks mark this by revolting, celebrating. And they never wanted to be conquered by the Macedonians in the first place. And they proceed to a revolt. And Alexander decides to make an example of the ringleader city of the rebellion, the city of Thebes one of the greatest cities in Thebes, uh, excuse me, in Greece. He conquers it, he kills all the men, enslaves the women and children, and as much as he can, he tears down all the buildings in town, with a few exceptions. And then he says, any other takers for rebellion? I thought not. <laughs> and he goes on to do similarly nasty things, particularly in the East, when he gets to Central Asia and South Asia. So they all use terror. Branding. They all made a huge emphasis on, as I said, simple images and simple slogans. For Alexander, it was the son of Zeus. I am the son of Zeus. For Hannibal, it was Heracles. I am Heracles. And also, Italy for the Italians. I've come to liberate all the members of the Roman Confederacy from the nasty Romans, whether you want to be liberated or not. And finally, Caesar. Caesar, one of the reasons what makes Caesar so fascinating is that Caesar was an absolute master of communication and a master of prose. While running for office, oh, excuse me, while running for office, while conquering Gaul, he was running for office, always looking ahead. And one of his tools is to write a book. We know this book as the Gallic Wars. It's a wonderful book, a uh, fantastic advertisement for uh, Caesar. But his most famous slogan doesn't come from the Gallic Wars. It comes later from a letter he writes, and then it's transferred to a uh, float in his triumphal parade. As I said, Caesar at one point has a detour to northern Turkey, and he wins the battle so quickly it's all over in five hours from the time he sights the enemy, gets, the enemy comes into sight to the time it's over. Uh, battle of uh, Zila uh, against a rather obscure opponent. And Caesar writes to one of his colleagues back in Rome, Weni Weedy Weeki, I came, I saw, I conquered. Now the purpose of this is not only to say how clever Caesar is, which he was, but how dangerous he is. One of C Caesar wanted everyone to know him for his speed. He is so fast, don't look twice, because Caesar's going to be in your neighborhood before you know it, and you're not going to like it. Weni Weedy Weeki says this. Perfect. It is the ultimate political slogan. Now, if we compare it to more recent political slogans, um, I think hope and change doesn't stack up half badly <laughs> against it. That, too, is a very memorable political slogan. And President Obama, when he was running in 2008, had a book. 
like the Gallic Wars in a way, and I think it was Rocco Landesman who, um, um, head of um, NEH, thank you. I don't think, what's it, NEA, NEA, uh, who said that this was uh, the best political book since Caesar's Gallic, since Caesar, best political writer since Caesar. Well, maybe the best political book since um, um, Six Crises, or um, what was JFK's book called? Thank you, Profiles and Courage. Caesar's book actually wasn't a book, uh, and it would be better be compared to, uh, to speeches, which, of course, uh, President Obama also gave some pretty good speeches. Um, Caesar's book was written uh, uh, in chapters, and they would be sent once a year to Italy, where they hired actors to read them out to the Romans. Look what Caesar's doing for you in Gaul. They're advertisements, uh, and they were meant to be dramatic, and they're very dramatic, uh, and, you know, he would kind of exaggerate certain things here and there. They're not meant to be uh, politically accurate, but they served a very important purpose in branding Caesar. And finally, the tenth quality, divine providence. This, of course, is not something that you um, uh, can hone the way you can hone skills at marketing. Uh, it's something that you have or you don't. So um, you can choose not to be a skeptic about that, if you will, but just let, let me give you just three examples. So Alexander, when he invades the Persian Empire, has a problem that I've alluded to several times. The Persians have the largest fleet in the world, and Alexander has a very small and utterly unreliable fleet. This is a big problem because the Persians have been invaded by Greeks before, or been threatened with Greek in invasion from Greece before, and they have a tried and true strategy. Send in the navy, cross the Aegean Sea, raise a rebellion in the Greeks' rear by giving lots of money to the Greeks at home who hate the Greeks abroad, and force the army back. It's worked before, and it's exactly the game plan they're going to play against Alexander. And they even have a Greek admiral named Memnon of Rhodes. Remarkable figure, uh, not much known in the history books, although there's several good novels about him. He's a Greek mercenary who's fought for the Persians most of his life, married a Persian aristocrat, and his children are half Persian, but he was forced into exile for part of his career. He spent his exile at the court of Philip of Macedon, where he got to know the young Alexander. I couldn't be making this up. <laughs> he is the leader of the Persian navy. He's leading the charge against Alexander. He's the brilliant strategist. He's the man who's going to win the war for Persia. And in the summer, of, and he's proceeding to do so, the navy's crisscrossing the Greek islands. It's get, Alexander's getting nervous, he's raising money to create a new fleet, and Memnon drops dead. So convenient that novelists want to imagine he was poisoned, but there is no reason to think he was poisoned. He's out of the picture, the Persians no longer have a naval offensive, they have to fight Alexander on land, the place where he's supreme, and the rest is history. Hannibal. Hannibal, as I said, does not win the war after the great victory of Cannae. As one of his lieutenants said afterwards, you know how to win a, a victory, Hannibal, but you don't know how to use a victory. You don't have a strategy for success. And Hannibal fritters away his victory at Cannae uh, by moving and going in too many different directions over the next few years. War in Sardinia, war in Sicily, war in Spain, trying to get the Greeks involved. Finally, in 207, so nine years after Cannae, he finally gets the reinforcement army he needed. His brother marches from Spain with 30,000 men and 16 elephants. Crosses the Alps, this time with ease. He's in northern Italy, and he and Hannibal are meant to uh, hook up in Umbria and face the Romans with their greatest fear, a large un army under the command of the most brilliant general of the age. But it doesn't happen because Hannibal's brother sends messengers to Hannibal, and these messengers get caught by the Romans, who read the battle plan, and they're there to uh, gang up on poor Hasdrubal, Hannibal's brother, to defeat his army and kill him in battle. They chop his head off, and they ride down to Hannibal hundreds of miles away, and they toss his head over the wall of Hannibal's camp. Uh, that gives Hannibal the idea that this war's not going to end well. Caesar? Well, um, the one example I will give is Caesar uh, has no navy. He knows that to win the war, he has to cross the Adriatic. You have to go by sea because there are no roads then to go from northern Italy 
to what is nowadays Albania. And he crosses the Adriatic not only with no navy, he's using merchant ships, but he does so at the end of autumn, the beginning of winter, the season when it's extremely dangerous. The enemy coast is blockaded by Pompey's fleet, a huge and very successful and efficient fleet. Caesar gets ashore without a scratch. Let me now just talk, just very briefly, because I don't want to um, try your patience, just very briefly about the five stages of war, which I think their careers illustrate this year. I think we have a tendency when looking at war and looking at it and saying, oh, war's simple. It's got a beginning, a middle, and the end. Either you win or you lose. But in fact, wars rarely go that way. Uh, as there's a wonderful military saying, which is that no war plan survives contact with reality. <laughs> and that was exactly the case with these three generals. They began with an attack, the first stage, but they immediately ran into the second stage, the re resistance. Because to quote another saying, the enemy gets a vote. And the enemy, of course, was not passive. The enemy tried to stop them. As I said, with Alexander, the Persian Navy. With Hannibal, the Romans send an army and a navy to Spain to try to take Spain away from the Carthaginians. Uh, with Caesar, Pompey evacuates Italy and sets up shop in an impregnable base in Albania and northern Greece. And so they have to deal with all of these threats. And they deal to some extent, with success to some extent or another. The third phase, which is the one they all wanted, was to get the enemy to fight on their turf to fight a pitched battle, because whatever else they could do, these folks could fight pitched battles, a set, formal um, uh, kind of battle, the Hollywood production number battle. For Caesar, it's the Battle of Pharsalus in central Greece. For Hannibal, it's the Battle of Cannae in southern Italy. For Alexander, it's the two battles of Issus in southern Turkey, followed by, two years later, the Battle of Galgamela in what is today Iraqi Kurdistan. Just think a few years ago, none of us would know where the Kurdish part of Iraq is, but now we all do. And these are great successes for Alexander, Hannibal, and Caesar. The trick is you now have to go to the next stage, which I call closing the net. It's 2003. We've defeated Saddam's forces in Iraq, his conventional army, uh, and we've declared victory, but the enemy isn't buying. And that, in a sense, is what faced each of these men after their great victory. How do you get the enemy to accept that he's been defeated? For Caesar, it meant raising more armies, raising more money, raising a fleet, going around the Roman world and fighting them again in the east and in the south and in the west. Years more of fighting. And battles, some of which he almost lost. The last one, the Battle of Munda in southern Spain, is the one in which Caesar came closest to defeat. So it was a near-run thing. For Alexander, it meant keeping up speed, the pressure, the speed, and being able to move seamlessly to fight unconventional warfare, which he proceeds to do. For Hannibal, it meant taking the Battle of Cannae and Rome's defeat and suddenly getting that as a way of getting the Romans to admit their defeat. But the Romans didn't want to admit their defeat. They had a political system that was strong enough to keep them, make it difficult for Hannibal to get them to admit to defeat. So his job was to find a combination of military and political tactics that would get Rome to surrender. And he failed to do it. He had another, um, he had for two, another 13 years, or 14 years after the Battle of Cannae, and he failed to do it. And in the end, the Romans copy his tactics. They build up new armies of their own. They conquer Spain, which they take from the Carthaginians. They invade North Africa. They force Hannibal to evacuate Italy after 15 years to fight them in North Africa and finally to be defeated by the Romans who have learned to fight the way that Hannibal fights. So Hannibal does not succeed in closing the net. Far from it. But there's a fifth stage as well. And that is knowing when to stop. <laughs> and that's something we've learned a bit about in our recent history. Clausewitz says nobody in his right mind would start a war without knowing what victory would consist of. 
goes back to strategy and having a clear idea of what you want. True enough, in any war, you have to be able to be agile and to roll with the punches and make changes. But you need to know what constitutes victory. For Alexander, the answer seemed to be nothing constitutes victory. He conquers the entire Persian Empire. It's huge, 3,000 miles from one end to another. He goes back to the new center of the empire, the capital at city at Babylon. And you might think he'd now say, well, now that I've conquered this empire, I better figure out how to govern it and how to hold it together. That's not what he does. He says, this was fun, but there's so many more worlds to conquer. He starts a war against Arabia. In fact, when he dies, he's weeks away from invading Arabia. And he accepts ambassadors from Italy and Carthage who are there to say to him, please, please, please don't invade us because they know perfectly well that he does plan to invade them. There is no end for Alexander. It's a plan that is the antithesis of grand strategy, war for its own sake. For Caesar, there is an end. Caesar had the advantage, unlike the other three, of having been a hugely successful politician before he became a great general. Caesar, Alexander and Hannibal are heroes of their 20s. They're heroes of the battlefield in their 20s. Caesar, kind of a man after my own heart, he only becomes a great general in his 40s. And he's still in his 50s when he is cut down uh, and still, fight, still leading the Romans into battle. Caesar has a strategy. It is to become the first man in Rome to have po be politically dominant, to, to cash in his military victories, to be politically dominant, and to use his political, mil political dominance to put into effect a series of reforms in Rome. Reforms that will make outsiders Roman citizens. Reforms that will find land for the landless. Reforms that will make Rome a safer city. Reforms that will open up the Italian citizenship to new groups, but that will always keep Caesar at the center of things. He wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to be the unacknowledged ruler of Rome, but he doesn't want anyone to call him a tyrant. He's willing to accept the title dictator, which for Romans is a slightly less sinister tone than for us. But he won't be called a king, because that is the same for us as being called a tyrant or a dictator or a death. He wants everyone, he doesn't want to have a bodyguard, because that would mean he was a tyrant. But he wants everyone just to love him, because he's so lovable. And of course, it can't work, and he knows it. He realizes that it can't work, and that's why he decides to leave and maybe never come back. It's much more fun on the battlefield than it is in, uh, in Rome, in the Senate House. So all three of these men were, in some sense, failures, great failures. Hannibal doesn't conquer Rome, uh, and he ends up a refugee who is forced to commit suicide rather than being captured by the Romans, although he does have a very long run before it happens. Alexander does not set up a new dynasty, does a fantastic job of conquering the Persian Empire, but a lousy job of turning it into something new. And Caesar, he does set up a dynasty. His grandnephew Octavian does eventually succeed him as Augustus. And Rome does change, but perhaps not in the way that Caesar wanted. The Republic is dead as a result of Caesar's victories, and Caesar does not get to enjoy it. So what's the bottom line? Uh, what can uh, we learn from these three men? Well, it's that even in a republic, a remarkably talented individual of enormous ambition and great vision and supreme technical skills and with the right infrastructure, who knows how to sell himself and has a little bit of help from above, such a person can rise to a position of supreme power and can change history. But if we're lucky and we're vig vigilant, we'll never suffer anyone to have the kind of power that these three did because they were missing two things that are essential in our leaders today. One is respect for the Constitution. Caesar put it most simply. He said, the Roman Republic is an empty shell a mere form without any substance. Or he said of his preceding dictator, Sulla, who had voluntarily retired, that guy didn't know his political ABCs. And finally, the one thing that they lacked, which I would submit 
is one of the most important qualities that any politician can have is humility. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.